I'd like to welcome everyone again to uh, Hemp Home Expo, and I would now like to introduce, um, I would say, one of the masterminds of uh, this virtual expo, Mr. Ramon Renados. He is the head organizer of uh, Hemp Home Expo, and I think uh, the best person to introduce himself is no other than Mr. Ramon Renados himself. Good afternoon, Mr. Ramon. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, Kimi. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. This has been a, a journey for all of us uh, to organize and deliver this event in just eight weeks. We are proud not only of the effort, but the way that the, everyone has received this call uh, throughout the planet. And we have over 30 speakers that ranges from 12 countries and four different continents. Um, we have um, people that are involved with um, from <clears throat> from building construction, designing hem home buildings, uh, manufacturers of uh, steel structures from plastic hem. We have people that are uh, building batteries. Uh, we have people that are working with biochar. In so uh, the, the, um, the range of, of options just within the hem home building experience and um, potential investments are large enough to, uh, to create a complete new circular economy around the world. Once again, um, it is a great pleasure for me to have you all. Yes, now uh, it is a great pleasure for us to welcome um, our good friend, Erin Lindy. Uh, Erin is yeah. right now in Calgary and she is now becoming the host of our uh, exposition. Welcome, Mary. Hello, thank you, and uh, well, uh, and hello to the rest of the world. I'm here in Calgary, and I'm ready to start the, our North American part of this beautiful expo. Uh, thank you, Ramon. I think that one of the most amazing things is watching you and the work that you do around the world to connect people together, especially because this plant is so important and I get goosebumps every time I think about it. So thank you, Ramon, for what you're doing. Um, so getting started with today. All right. Well, welcome to the North American side of the hemp home expo one of the most great the great things about Ramon is is that now and hemp engineering is that now we get to see the entire world so it is 6 30 in the morning here in Alberta and I'm here to start the day I'd like to first start us off with Carl Martel I've had the honor of working with Carl Martel now for over three years and I can confidently tell you he is the world's foremost expert on how to make anything out of hemp and so um, we're going to hear today about some new innovations that he's been working on and some things that might blow your mind about how you can utilize this beautiful plant. So go ahead, Carl. Gotta unmute yourself. I'm there not you sure go. what I got it, uh, Ramon was handling it in the background. All right, thank you very much, uh, Ramon, and everybody for joining this morning and today. Uh, just let me share my screen here, just a second. I'll get that, share, and I think this is the button I'm supposed to push. That's the one. There we go. All right. So I'm gonna be talking about today building integrated energy storage from cannabis plant materials, right? And uh, so B-I-E-S. Um, do I just press this button for now? There we go. All right, so uh, for those of you, I see there's a few people in the audience that uh, know some of my work. So I'm gonna go fairly quickly on some of the things through some of these slides and then, um, and then focus a little bit more on some of the more updated stuff that I've put into this. So this is, uh, cannabis is everything. You know, the, the Greeks teach us that everything can be everything and everything can be turned into anything and anything can be turned into something else. You know, and if you're not looking close enough, uh, you're not seeing God's architecture. 
So I think that's, that's one of the key things about hemp, I think is really most interesting is that you can really do everything with this thing, you know, everything from, this is why I'm a big proponent of whole plant utilization. You know, you can have everything from food, you know, to fiber and clothing, to your soaps, to cosmetics, to whatever. I mean, you know, that's, that's uh, one of the reasons why I made that mind map um, to really demonstrate all the different things that, that, that can actually come from this plant and why it's really important to, uh, when working with this plant, is to remember that and, and to say, you know, for example, one, you know, it's been proposed in the past, well, oh, we can make biodiesel from the, from, from the seed. Yes, we can. Um, and, you know, this has come up a few times and I like to try and point out a few things. You know, so everybody knows it's like, yeah, we can. The problem is with that is like, just like with corn. If we're growing corn for fuel, we're not growing it for food, right? But if we can grow a plant that can do multiple things, right? Then we can kill more than, more than one bird, right? With that one stone, right? You wanna grow a plant that you can do multiple things with. So if you think, okay, well with the hemp, we can grow it for grain. And if you grow for dual use crop, like hemp can get very big. So if we're growing it for, for grain, we can grow it for both that and use the waste fiber to develop other things from it. So, and from those other things, okay, we might not get diesel, but we can get ethanol or methanol. These are other fuels that we can actually use in our vehicle and not by using the arable land for growing fuel, but for growing food. And then as a secondary, we grow it for fuel or other things. So, oh, I guess this didn't really all come out. So, You'll notice that I put in here cannabis. So everybody thinks, uh, we, why are we talking about cannabis? You know, we should be talking about hemp, hemp creek, you know what I'm saying? Well, hemp is cannabis, right? So it's just another word for cannabis. And, and people seem to have this thing in their mind. So what's the first thing that you think of when you say cannabis? Well, for me, and I think a lot of people, the first thing you think of is smoking marijuana or drugs, these sort of things. Well, in actuality, you know, it's not just that, you know, it's, it's everything else, you know, that's, I think is the, the really important message. Like I, I try to say to people, you know, I say, look, when I go to a supermarket and I look at a potato, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Vodka? Well, for me, it's not vodka. It's like potato chips or French fries or other things, right? Why is it that we say cannabis, we think pot or marijuana, you know, for me, it's food, you know, 95% of all cannabis grown in Canada is actually for food, the seed, right? And the rest is actually then developing into these other products. And so we need to get our mindset around, uh, around that sort of thing. Stop thinking about it as a drug. Think about it as everything else. So what do I do? Well, I'm a cannabis research scientist, you know, industrial science industrial side of things, so industrial cannabis, medicinal cannabis, recreational cannabis, I've worked in all the fields right across uh, this industry, developing different things. I focus a lot of my research though, on uh, the building side of things, so the industrial cannabis side, where you can turn this into, because it generates a lot of what could be considered kind of waste, but it's not actually waste, because you just repurpose it and turn it into other things. So I think a lot of people already know some of the things you can do with this, so but in this slide here, I show things like a, a geo hemp. So this is kind of a, a concrete uh, type of material here in the top left corner. Then you have, you know, hemp plastics. Uh, again, this is the one here where it's kind of a clear plastic. That's pure hemp, by the way. There's nothing else in that. That is the cellulose from the hemp and the oil from the hemp seed to make that plastic, right? So there's no other ingredients in that. And then you have your cottonized fibers, you know, paints, paints and stains from the hemp oil, but these are not oil generally for, they weren't pressed for actually making paint. This is actually repurposed from expired food grade hemp oil. So the industry has a waste stream that's actually generated and, and you have this hemp oil that's expired, right? It can no longer go towards food. Well, we can repurpose it and turn it into paints, right? Uh, then you have other products here. This is kind of like, kind of a, carbon foam. So this material is kind of like that next uh, generation or it could be an alternate generation of basically like hempcrete. This one mixed in with the inorganic binders 
uh, the, the, car the carbon in that, that's what makes it black, the char, the biochar that's in there reacts with the water and the minerals there and it foams up and then solidifies and you have all these nice little air bubbles inside that. Uh, next, we are going to look at, this here is just a oil absorbance, right? Next one is again, this is a, a carbon uh, conductor paper, okay? So it's a it's conductive paper. So it's the cellulose with the, the biochar and it can conduct electricity. All right, so I'm gonna give it a little update as well on some of the things that I'm doing right now. Um, in this picture here, you're gonna see multiple kind of different things and what I call tropical soil hempcrete. So this material, uh, raw material is very abundant. It's the, the red earth that you see in the tropical zones all around the planet um, are these kind of laterite soils. And, and, and they make up about one third of the world's continental crust. So this stuff is abundant, like you wouldn't believe. So this is something as well that be kind of similar to hempcrete. Traditional hempcrete is made with lime as the binder and then hemp. Well, this one here is just basically using that soil that I've modified a little bit, created the geopolymer by adding a, a simple salt and it changes basically the structure, the chemical rearrangement, if you want, um, of the, of the alumina silicates that are within that soil, right? So this one here would be basically zero carbon emissions and some very interesting properties that you get from, from the, these materials as well. And I don't know if anybody can hear it or not, so I'll try and get close, but. Right? And this can be added with the, the hemp or um, other natural biomasses. The, up in this top, right corner here. This doesn't look like much because it, it's set very, very quickly and before I had a chance to handle it. But this is actually from banana. So these are banana leaves that were actually ground up and added to it. There's the hemp just above it. The one I was just tapping on, this is actually biochar and this uh, tropical soil. And it gets to be quite hard. And then here, of course, is your hemp herd with, the, uh, with this red soil. Lightweight, fast set. Uh, very interesting kind of material and very abundant. So when the lime isn't available, this can actually be used. And it's actually, it's, it's, it's a modified type of thing that's existed for a very long time. And people have been building houses like this in, in Africa, even presently, or in Peru, or many, many places where they're taking just the earth or the, the clays that are there, mixing it with, you, know, you can just add in whatever biomass you have available, and they're making their structures with it. This takes it just a little, one step further, you know, where we can actually make it even harder and more environmentally resistant to um, <coughs> weathering and other things. So <laughs> I'm gonna talk for a few seconds about building because we, this is a building conference and everything else. And I wanna just point out where I, where I was, where I was seeing is like this structure that's being built. Now, if you look closely, you're gonna see two different colors here. You're gonna have red. And this is like these, these, these bricks here. They're kind of a, a clay brick that's been fired and they have holes in them, okay? These are non-structural, but they're used for infilling these walls, very similar to the way that we would actually do with hempcrete. Now, if you see the gray, this is the concrete, okay? There's the floor and there's the posts. Now, th this structure, it basically your, your load is carried on that gray part, okay? So the red, okay, does not carry weight. And remember, hempcrete, can be load bearing, but then you're losing certain other properties. You know, we want to look at insulated, the more insulative properties of hempcrete. And that's where hempcrete could actually fill in quite well here. So all that red that's here, right, can be replaced with hempcrete, right? Your load is now carried on this, and then you just have your insulated walls in between. This would be a lot more environmentally friendly than what's actually being used there at the moment. I mean, those red bricks are fired at 800 to 1,000 degrees Celsius, right? That's what you need to do for clay. Now, I've just showed you before these tropical soil hempcrete, right, or tropical soil clays that can be done actually at room temperature. So the, the clays that I was just showing a second ago from red earth, these are done at room temperature. There's no, there's no heat added to these sort of things. So we can improve a lot of these things. now. So I, I'm wanting to show you the outside surfaces and then eventually what they would do is they coat the outside of that with a lime plaster and you have your finished building. So, or you can put something like this on the outside of the building. This is what they call building 
integrated photovoltaics. So they're taking the solar panels and they're essentially wrapping the building, okay, in uh, solar panels and then would feed the grid. Now they're not as efficient as say solar panels that are actually angled perfectly to the sun and, and rotate with it. But because of the surface area of the building that compensates, okay, for these, this lack of efficiency, right? Because you get more surface area and more of the sun as the sun goes around it, you're, it's hitting, always hitting a solar panel as it goes around. And these are what they called BIPVs or Building Integrated Photovoltaics. And that, that acronym I just wanted to point out, it's just like at the beginning, Building Integrated Energy Storage. And this is where I'm going. So this here, this was just published about uh, not even a month ago, I guess. Um, and it says here, world's first rechargeable cement-based batteries. Well, not quite world's first, but it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a step in the right direction. So the same kind of principle applies here. This is a BIES, Building Integrated Energy Storage, right? So where they're integrating your energy storage. So say your, your building is wrapped with the solar panel, then it can actually just store that energy right into the building okay, where the energy can actually be in stored. Now I'm gonna focus a little bit of attention on this slide for a few minutes. So, so it says here the average energy density, okay, is seven watts, okay, per meter square, or square meter, right? Or 0 0.8 watt hours per liter. Now you're gonna to say to yourself, well, that's not very much, 0 0.8, so we're just gonna round that up to one, one watt hour per liter. Well, the, a lead acid battery, you know, is somewhere up in that 40 kind of number range. So we think, oh, hey, that's not very good. But the thing is, you have to remember that if we take into account, now we're talking about meters squared versus volume in this case. So squares to uh, square to versus volumes, right? Surface area over volumes. So this is in, in regards to buildings. Now, buildings can be quite big. If I'm going to take a simpler example, just say a road. Say a road that is a six meters wide, a thousand meters long, so one kilometer. And six meters is about the size of a two lane road, okay, both directions. That works out to be, um, what was it that I was working on? So 6,000, okay, so 6,000 uh, square meters there. So you take that 6,000 and times it by that number. Now you got a much bigger number. Right now we're talking about seven forty seven and six is 42, 42,000 watts hours per square meter. So now we're actually surpassing. Now think about it. How many miles of roads or kilometers of roads do we have on the planet? And if we started actually doing this sort of thing, how much energy could we then actually store in areas where all we're doing is driving on it? So I think this is where the, you know, the idea of, of storing our energy in the spaces that we don't actually use, you know, can, can actually be good. And, and some of these things are, are very cheap and renewable. The way this is constructed, so the way this first one was actually done is um, they have these two layers, right? So as it shows there, it's a carbon fiber mesh with iron coated, the other one is nickel coated. So, and these, this, this carbon, right? This can either be, I don't know which one it is, it could be pan, it could be graphite, which some of the other ones, we can also be doing it with biochar, right? So these carbon type materials, we have lots and lots of carbon, right? And then you just have that, that in between and I'll just, I'll describe a little bit more as we go further on, but this is one of the first ones that, that actually doing this into the concrete, where is it? So we have here. So the other one is a, is a battery because of the way it was actually kind of designed. So you have iron and nickel, and you can have a type of uh, battery system there. This one here is more of a supercapacitor. And this one was kind of interesting too. And this was published back in about 2020, about a year now that this came out where they had bricks and they used P-dot uh, coated on these things and they fired. These are just regular bricks that they actually bought from Home Depot, put this coating on it, fired it up. And then they were able to actually then generate this, this electricity. Now this one is again, not very much. Uh, it takes three of those bricks to actually light that LED light. But the, 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 the important thing to remember is you know, but if we add lots and lots and lots of these, right, then we're having that surface area, then it doesn't really matter. So I think this is the direction in which we're kind of going. So what's a battery? So I'm going to go through this really quickly uh, for those that, that don't know what a battery is. Um, so here in your simple 
Duracell battery or AA battery, you have this carbon rod in the center. That's your positive. Now that carbon is generally from uh, graphite. And then beside that, you're going to have basically your paste, your electrolyte, okay? And other composites. You have then your electrolyte in there that's, that has your ions and the reaction that you have going on. So you have your positive in the middle, your paste around that, and then you have your zinc. You have your zinc basically metal that coats it around. That's your negative. And that's basically how a battery is actually made. So it's just those simple ingredients of a carbon, electrolyte, and another metal, and you have a reaction that kind of goes on. These are some of the more basic ones. Uh, as you get into more, uh, your nickel cadmium batteries, these are what they call jelly rolls. So they have, and this is where it plays more on surface area. So you have this long film that's actually coated, and then they roll it up and put it back into the, into, inside the, the, uh, the can, and then that's how that works. And that functions more on surface area inside a battery. Whereas the other one has more, has a different type of reaction, but it's, you get to the same thing. Okay, so, so first understand nature, then copy it. You know, I was thinking of a while back, I was going, you know, what is a tree? But I guess in this case too, we could be thinking, what is hemp? You know, and how plants and, and these sort of things, how they work. And I started thinking to myself, I'm going, you know, what are these things? And essentially it's mother nature's way of storing energy. So you have, let's just take, think of a tree for a moment. It has leaves. The leaves are like little solar panels. They collect the sunlight. They have a reaction called photosynthesis where then they take up carbon dioxide. They hold on to the carbon and release the oxygen. That carbon then goes on to build basically your leaves, your bark, everything else, right? And all that energy, right, is basically stored in that tree. So you're holding on to that carbon, it's sequestering that carbon, right? The, 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 this little power plant tree, you know, is doing all these things and then storing that energy. Why are we saying it's storing? Well, because if you take that tree and all that carbon that's there, you cut it down, dry it, take a match, light that piece of, of wood, what happens? We have fire and it's the release of that energy. So mother nature is storing the energy, right? Then come along, you put fire and you release that energy. Now, the other interesting, cool thing about this, though, the, why I like this picture, is that you can see a light and it's actually plugged into the tree. Well, they've actually done some, some studies and actually taken a look at this. And you can actually, trees actually generate electricity. And you can plug in a small light, basically, and, and have that sort of thing. So is this the future? Or, you know, we can harvest energy directly from the forest. I think that's kind of cool. It's not a whole lot of energy um, because the plant is actually very uh, economic, I guess could be a word that you use where it, it uses and generates what it needs, right? So it's not storing up a whole lot of extra. And, uh, you know, so you'd only be getting a little bit. I mean, it's a very economical system there, right? It's not, it's not wasteful. So plant carbons, you know, we're talking about carbons here um, and what, what's inside a battery. Right now, what's inside of a battery is what's called graphite. Graphite is an allotrope of carbon, just like, um, diamonds or coal or others, and it's just how they're kind of broken up and how they uh, kind of look. You got crystalline carbons, you got amorphous carbons. Plants, plant carbons are kind of amorphous, and then the graphite would be crystalline. And the difference really between them is one is a very structured, the other one is kind of all over the place. There's no, there's no structure to it. The, the other thing though is that's very important is graphite is mined from the ground, whereas plant carbons, we can grow from the ground. One is much more sustainable than the other. Graphite is a finite resource, right? Where hemp or plant carbons, right, are infinite, right? We can just keep growing and they're sustainable and they go back. Now we grow those car, you know, we grow these plants. Hemp is great, grows very quickly in 90 days, you know, sequesters that carbon as it's growing and everything else, right? And if we remove it from the field, you know, and we convert it then into these stable carbons, which is biochar or charcoal or uh, other words we use for it. These then become very stable in the environment and can last in the environment for thousands of years. So we can sequester carbon for much longer periods of time, you know, after the plant has actually produced it and we can make it, convert it to carbons and away we go. In the chart beside here, it actually shows some of what they've actually been trying to do with the different plant carbons, right? And making supercapacitors and batteries from those carbons. And you can see, uh, I don't know if you, how well you can see everything here, um, 
but you'll see the activation method and the electrolyte that they use. And actually hemp is actually down in here, I believe. I think this one has the, the hemp on there. Yeah, third one from the bottom, right? And so they show how that it was actually uh, made. So the activation method was HTC, which is hydrothermal carbonization, right? So they take the, the plant matter, put it basically in water, and it's a, a solution with some salts, and it's an autoclave to close it up and put on the heat, and then they create the, car the, the carbon that way. It's also called hydrochar. So you got biochar, hydrochar, they're all essentially the same, just different methods for pre producing biochar. And you can get different products from those. Um, and so what's kind of neat though, too, you know, you can see the different surface area within the material, and then also what it can actually do um, to, to, to generate electricity or store energy, the energy capacity that's in that, you know, with hemp, for example, the studies that they've shown, if I'm talking in, in, in supercapacitors, it's just a number just to, to give you kind of a, an idea. It's 140 farads per gram. But if you look up a little bit further, you have another carbon, right? Like sugarcane, for example, with the gas, right? Well, that you can actually get up to 300 farads per gram, you know, and then you have others in there as well. So there's some different, some interesting things about the, the plant carbons that are lending towards our studies of uh, energy storage, right? So, and different carbons or different plant carbons will produce different things, you know, and get different results based on the natural architecture that nature began with. So I think a lot more studies need to go into this and more standardization and understanding of basically the activation method, uh, the electrolytes that we use and much more standards. So we can actually start comparing a lot better to this. So, um, so I'm going to go back to the a little bit, a few slides before and they talked about, you know, the first concrete battery or, you know, storage of that. Um, so this is some of the work that I began a number of years ago. So it's conductive crete and how I stumbled across it while I was working with the hempcrete and going, well, there are some issues with this and how it, you know, to make it work a little bit better. And then I, one day I said, okay, what do we take biochar? And I just add it to the lime and see what happens. And in the Im image above, you can see that actually that material, so this is just a lime and the biochar mixed together, um, produce basically 1.03 volts, right? So and the way I did that was just basically you had that, that lime plaster or little piece, you know, it's uh, something like this, about that thick separator, which is just a piece of toilet paper. Uh, put some salt water on it, and then a piece of aluminum foil. So my positive in this case is the is the the lime and carbon, and then the aluminum foil was my negative, and then I would get basically a 1.03. So that's what then got me into thinking, yeah, can we store energy into into walls and whatnot? So I began doing that uh, back in 2012, thereabouts. This one was done in 2014. So I started thinking more and more about that and then developed that concept of building integrated energy storage. So in this one here, you have a hempcrete basically brick and uh, that hempcrete brick uh, is, is, is what's actually charging that tablet. So that brick is 4.5 volts thereabouts because the tablet requires that for, for the charging and about four or five amps. So again, I'm trying to get people to think about um, about this sort of thing. So if you think, okay, if that's, we're just gonna round up some numbers here. We'll say five volts, five amps. Now starting all, the, now start counting all the bricks on the side of that building, right? Now we start adding up all those volts and all those amps, you know, we can start getting up into some large numbers. If you have a thousand bricks on that wall, well, you now have, you know, 5,000 volts and 5,000 amps, right? That can actually be stored from solar panels on your roof or, wrapped in the building or whatever, and then stored energy into that building material. Um, and and the, the important thing with this too is to start thinking about, okay, people say, well, how much, what's the energy density? It doesn't really matter too, too much. It's more based on the surface area, but what's even more important is probably thinking about the, the cycle life. So, you know, if you have, one of the problems with having it locked into concrete. So say, you know, we have it in that building, and we build that thing. Well, okay, say the charge cycle is only 500. Well, that's not gonna last very long and we'll have to tear down the building in two years and rebuild it. You're gonna need to start looking at, we need to start looking at and focusing on the charge cycle, right? So we, for a building, to be able to store energy in a building, 
it's going to be something in the neighborhood of you know, 40,000 or 100,000 charge cycles for, for that to actually um, make things work in the long term, right? You need something that's going to last 40 to 100 years, right? That, that, that you can actually charge and discharge. And I think that's what the beauty is of some of these carbons, you know, in storing energy in this carbon. Like I said, stable carbons, right, can be, will remain stable for thousands of years. So that's not where the issue is. It has to do with how we can actually react with these things and then how we build our structures and, and to, to see about, okay, end of life, what do we do? Well, these ones here, when you're actually brick, the reason why I designed it this way, we have that red and they have the black, is that say, for example, brick number uh, 9173 uh, shows up on your computer and says, oh, this, this, this battery, this brick is not functioning properly. Well, you remove that section and you replace it with uh, a new one, just like a, a breaker switch at, when you go to the store. So dual carbon, you know, in your cycle lives, uh, surface areas, these are all really important. This is an experiment I did down in Australia where I took basically two different uh, carbons. One in my left hand is graphite. So that's one allotrope. And then the other hand is a carbonized hemp stock. Took both of these and uh, actually ran down to Byron Bay, the <laughs> scooped out some water from the bay. And it's just salt water in that cup. When I put the two different carbons into the water, it generated basically enough energy to actually turn on that little light. And that's where you start talking about dual carbon. Now, we're going to go back again to that, that very first one where they talk about the uh, battery in the concrete. If you look again, remember there was two kind of meshes, one that had iron and one that had nickel onto, they were functionalized onto the carbon mesh. So this is essentially a, a dual carbon battery, but they've been functionalized in two different ways, right? So that they actually create that, that difference. Same thing we have in this picture here. And this is what's actually showing up in this next slide. Right, where we talk about manganese hydrogen battery. The important thing to remember here is you have your separator and then you have the two carbon felts that have been functionalized differently. Again, carbon playing a very important role in any of these technologies, right? They are the, the scaffold or the base for building any of these storage systems. So flow batteries and quinones. Um, so what do quinones have to do actually with, uh, with hemp, and I'll get to that in a second, but a flow battery is basically two liquid tanks that run past um, a, a different, uh, run past an electrode to generate that, electro, that current or electricity. So, and again, important thing here to remember is the porous carbon electrode. See, carbon playing a very important role in, in a lot of different battery technologies, and flow batteries seem to be one of these technologies that are up and coming as a way of storing energy on grid scale. This is not for your car. This is for, you know, houses and, uh, you know, buildings, these sort of things. So what was I think, what was I said, mentioning about quinones? Well, quinones, you know, can actually be produced from CBD. So, you know, we've been talking a lot about CBD and its medicinal value and other things, but at some point there's gonna be an excess of CBD. What do we do with it then? Well. Under these conditions, so under alkaline conditions, remember CBD can convert into different things. So under acidic conditions, right, it follows a different line and we end up with uh, delta eight and other things, you know, with CBN, we can convert a bunch of different things that way. Uh, and it also converts over to THC, right? So that's under those acidic conditions, but under alkaline conditions, then it can go over to a quinone. And we can have other medicines that are actually produced uh, that way as well, um, but, as I was showing you before in the flow cell battery, they're using uh, quinones from rhubarb to then produce the, the energies from that. So that's what I think makes really kind of interesting. Is again, looking at the whole plant for what we can actually do and looking at the, the waste streams that are there, you know, and then how to we repurpose them, for example. So we have basically two essential things to make up a battery. We need an electrolyte. Well, we now know that quinones and CBD, you know, could potentially be that one source for, for the energy and also carbon where it actually that energy is stored, both of which are essentially grown from the ground. I think, you know, whole plants in the future or uh, whole batteries in the future can actually be grown from the ground, not mined from the ground. And this is a perfect example of that, the carbon that we can get from growing from the ground and the quinones that we get from growing from hemp. And I think that's everything. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Do we have any questions or anything from the audience? Erin, it's cutting off. I think your your internet connection is a little bit a uh, little bit weak. Yes, yes, we go slow, no problem. Yeah. I, I believe. Thank uh, you. That was amazing. Yes, uh, Carl. Thank you very much for your uh, outstanding presentation. Um, may I suggest that uh, we wait for Erin? And okay. yes, um, we will have uh, questions from the audience. If you are ready to rock and roll. Yeah. Plant carbos are abundancias. Yes, and what else? Absolutely amazing. Yeah. So yeah. there's one here, it's asking if we could share the, the PowerPoint uh, with us by email. Sure, I think Ramon, I've already sent you the uh, PDF. So anybody that's on the list that wants the, uh, wants the presentation, uh, just please share it with them. Yes, uh, we will be um, uploading the presentation in uh, shortly. Uh, um, um, we will bring good news to the audience with respect to the recordings. Uh, all recordings will be available for 30 days for all the attendees. So um, uh, that's, uh, you don't have to worry about that. Um, yes. Um, I don't know. Uh, hey, Carl, great stuff as always, as always. How do we connect one brick to the other in this case? <laughs> I, I think it's a question from uh, Sergey. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, it, it's, it, it can be as simple as that. So say you want to increase your voltage. Okay. So let's just deal with this one thing at a time, make it very simple. So yeah, you would take one brick, you can just stack it one on top of the other. Say each brick was one volt, okay? You'd have then, you'd have one brick, you'd go one, two, three, four, five. Well, that would be five volts. So that could be as simple as that to, to increase the voltage of those bricks. If you wanted to increase the, the amperage output, then it's just a different question of organizing the, the wiring for those. But they can actually all be stacked up. So like I say, if you have a thousand, potentially, you know, you have a thousand bricks on your wall, Right, that can all be uh, connected so that you, you actually have a thousand volts there. And then you go through uh, a different system so that you can actually then use that sort of voltage in your house and whatnot. Um, you know, the, 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 the technology exists, right? So how do, how do we connect these onto uh, a walling system? I guess, you know, we could go with something like a monorail uh, for every row of bricks, for example, right? Um, each brick con connects into this rail and that rail is that what actually carries the energy. So you'd have like for every row of bricks, you have a, a string and you hook them all up together. So they can be connected in various ways uh, to store that energy and deliver that energy. We have another comment. Um, it will be very good initiative here in Ghana. Uh, since Africa is struggling with sufficient power generation. Right. Yes, I think I think it would be a very beneficial um, in, in many many parts of the world that don't have the infrastructure um, to to reach out to some of the more remote communities. Right, they, 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 the government just doesn't have the ability or means to to bring. Uh, you know, you have power generation here, but you have to send it a thousand kilometers that way, and it takes lots of posts and everything else, and it's, it's huge infrastructure. Yes, by having storage like this or uh, something available right and it, it's a lot easier to transport a solar panel bring it out to a, a community that's say a thousand kilometers away in the middle of the amazon or in the middle of the somewhere in somewhere in africa that's very far away or even up in northern um northern alaska or uh, you know all kinds of places where you can actually bring that bring bring that material out to them you know, in a modular way, right? 
bring it out there and away they go. And, and a lot of this technology too, what I'm talking about is very environmentally friendly. So, I mean, you could actually, uh, Kumsan, you can build your own battery, right? There, you know, at home, um, you know, very, very easily. You know, that this is what I'm actually trying to do and develop is, is these sort of things where, you know, you can, people can learn how to make a battery, right? And they can make it themselves using very cheap and abundant materials, right? That are available to them. So like I say, that one that I was showing you with, with the cup and it had the two different carbons, that's just salt water from the ocean, right? We can use salt water like that to, to generate electricity. Now it's not, the, it's not the most powerful, it's nowhere near like lithium, but you know, you, you say, okay, well, I just built the sides to suit, the, suit my needs. And, and you can build these so that they're rechargeable. And so all you would need then is a solar panel or a wind source, you know, where you have a turbine turning or uh, hydro of some kind, you got a, you got a stream that's going by, you know, you can build, you can buy little turbines that produce, you know, a thousand watts of energy. Um, if you have a, a stream coming through and you have the right, right amount of head, right, to turn that little turbine, well, that's generating energy all the time. Okay, but we have to use it. But how do we store it? Well, we create these batteries and put them out there. So yes, I think this could be a great option for a lot of either developing countries or countries that have already developed that it, you know, it just, uh, it doesn't make sense. Islands in the Pacific, for example, you know, how do they generate electricity? Right now they run diesel, you know, a diesel engine or something like that to, to generate electricity. Well, this one here, you know, in some places where the, the tropical regions where there's lots of abundant sunlight, you know, you just need a solar panel and create this battery and it doesn't have to be toxic. You know, like lead acid batteries, your car batteries, you know, you're using sulfuric acid. You don't want to drink that. You don't want to spill that, you know, and the lead, Lead is not nice. We already know that from thousands of years. You know, the Romans knew that too when they made their cups out of lead and then they drank out of them and got very sick. Well, it's not something good, but we can use things that are quite to, you know, we just heard about the benefits of, of biochar, right? That it's actually detoxifying. I'm going to be, I'm preparing an article as well for either hemp today or uh, in regards to biochar, where I'm looking at a lot of these different things that actually hemp can. Uh, hemp chars can do or plant chars can do in general a whole range of things from adding to uh to, to buildings your concrete you know your five percent addition of a biochar to concrete you get a 30 percent compressive strength improvement you know that's enormous um for roads you know you're, you're instead of adding aggregates the other aggregates to it you're adding the biochar to it you know i add you know to these things here it makes them harder and do other things. And then you can create other ones here that I, uh, for making your batteries and other things. So biochar, I think, is, is, has a huge future ahead of it, a huge potential that we are generally just touching right now. I think the 21st century will be the century of carbon. That is amazing. Thank you so much, Carl, for uh, your insight into this plant and all the miraculous things that it can do.